to begin recording okay recording has started so in the last uh, lecture we were talking about gradient descent algorithms okay and the idea was that i'm going to pick xk plus 1 as xk minus alpha k dk gradient of fxk and dk is supposed to be positive definite matrix and of course the gradient of the function f needs to be computed at xk okay so let's look at a picture so let's say this is my x star this is my fx equal to 1 contour this is my fx equal to 2 contour and so on okay and let's say i'm standing at this point this is my xk so the gradient of the function fxk would be outward facing out, outward facing and normal to this particular contour at that point okay so this is my gradient of fxk and i have to take a positive definite matrix multiply it with the gradient so um this would be my minus dk gradient of fxk and i pick a step size of value alpha k so this is my step size so let's say my alpha k is something and so i reach here which is xk plus 1 so this xk plus 1 is xk minus alpha k dk gradient of fxk and then at this point i'm again going to do the computation all over again so this would be my gradient of fxk plus 1 uh this would be my dk plus 1 minus dk plus 1 gradient of fxk plus 1 and then i'll pick an appropriate value of alpha k and i'll proceed in this direction okay so is this picture clear to everyone this is how the this is the pictorial way of representing how gradient descent works how should we choose the step size yeah so i'll get to it in a bit okay so we have to figure out how to pick alpha k and we have to figure out how to pick dk okay so i'm just going to go over that in a short while all right so if there are no further questions let me proceed to choosing dk so the first algorithm is steepest descent where my dk is identity matrix okay so in this case it's the vanilla gradient descent or the steepest descent algorithm where dk is identity all the time now let me tell you why this algorithm makes sense or or is there another way to derive this algorithm so let's say i want to fxk plus d and i want to minimize with respect to all d in rn 
okay this is what i want to do of course uh, d and rn is very difficult to solve and of course this function is this is exactly what we are trying to do uh, so what i'm going to do is instead of solving this problem i'm going to approximate it and i'm going to say look at the first order taylor series and I want to minimize with respect to D in Rn. Now this is an ill post problem because D is the entire space and this is a linear function in D. So I can potentially take minus infinity multiplied by gradient of the function. So I need to somehow bound the D. So instead I'm going to consider the following problem. Minimize D less than equal to gradient Fxk and the first order approximation of the function f. Okay, so I'm bounding the norm of d to be the same as the norm of the gradient of function f, f evaluated at xk itself. Now what's the solution to this problem? What is dk star here? What's the value of dk star for this problem? Minus of gradient fxk. Yeah. Why would you say that? Uh, because it will, if it, it will be the minimum that can that is possible. That will, if it's a, it will be. We'll be subtracting the whole thing from fxk. So right. that's my right, right. Yeah. So this is the minimum, this is the point, this is the dk star at which the minimum will be achieved for this objective function. So this doesn't depend on d at all. So not, not dependent on d. Okay, this is the only term that depends on d. And so I'm trying to minimize a function so i'm trying to minimize v transpose d v is some vector and norm of d is less than equal to r the solution to this problem is going to be v over norm of sorry minus v over norm of v multiplied by r and that's exactly why the optimal solution for this is going to be negative gradient fxk. So what I've wanted to mention here is um, by picking to minimize the first order expansion of the function f at xk, uh, you get the steepest descent algorithm. Okay, any questions on the steepest descent algorithm? Now, can we do something better? What can we do better in this approach? Any thoughts? Okay, so let's think about it. So we pick the first order Taylor expansion here. So in this case, we pick the first order Taylor expansion. Can we do something better here or something different? It may not be better, or we don't know whether it's better or not, but something different. Can we do something different here? Can you better see here? Sorry? Can you say that again? We can expand the Taylor series more and take the second terms. Yes. Okay, so good idea. Let's do that. So the idea is I want to minimize Fxk plus T 
D in Rn. Instead of minimizing the original function, let's solve the following problem. So I'm taking the second order Taylor series. Okay, and let's assume for the time being that the second derivative at xk is a positive definite matrix. Okay, so I have now a, a problem where I have a quadratic function of d and a fine function of d and something that doesn't depend on d, so it doesn't depend on d. Okay, so let's uh, let's look at how to solve this problem. So what do you suggest? So we have a quadratic function of quadratic affine function of D. How should I go ahead and solve this minimization problem? So let's look at it uh, from the basic principle. Is it a convex problem or it's not a convex problem? It's convex. Convex, why would you say so? Because uh, like they have a quadratic form on DT. We right. assume. Any any other thoughts? Why would the it be a problem? Yeah, go ahead. The assumption that we have taken that the second derivative is always positive uh, satisfies the convexity. Right. So if I look at the second derivative of this function, um, the second derivative is actually gradient of fxk. And since this is positive definite, the function itself, the function of d is convex because the minimizing variable is d here. It's as a function of d, this whole expression is convex. So I can just take the uh, first derivative and set it equal to zero. And so the first derivative is d star. So at d star, the first derivative of this expression must be equal to zero or dk star, I should write, which means dk star is, so this is invertible matrix. So I have the gradient of f, but it gets pre-multiplied by the second derivative inverse. Okay, and so this is Newton's method. Dk is equal to fxk inverse, second derivative inverse. This is called Newton's method. Okay, any questions so far? Um, yeah. Can you explain how did you get like the, the second derivative, d, d star k plus first derivative x, f of x of k equal to zero? Oh, this, this equation? Yes, exactly. Yeah, okay, so let's look at this as a function of d. So, so let me rewrite it here. So I have V transpose D, I want to minimize um, over all D, V transpose D plus half D transpose QD. Okay, where Q is a positive definite matrix. Okay, now this is a convex function. Do you agree with that? This is a convex function of D. And the reason it's convex function of D, let me call it G of D is because, well, look at the first derivative of G. And this derivative is with respect to D, of course. So this is QD plus V. And the second derivative of G with respect to D is 
q okay and q is positive definite so therefore it must be a convex function of t does that make sense yeah that's okay sense. now what did we learn about the convex function well d star is optimal if and only if gradient of gd is equal to zero or g at d star is equal to zero right this is something we proved in the previous class yes right so two d star plus v equals to zero which means d star equals to q inverse v minus q inverse v okay and that's exactly what i'm doing here that's what this equation implies Yep. Yep. Understood. Perfect. Thank you. Any further question on this? Okay. Can we do something better? Even better than Newton's method? Any thoughts? All right, so let's look at gradient descent method, okay? Now, I want you to think about big problems, okay? Not small problems, so not where xk is one or two dimensional or five dimensional uh, object, but it could be 100 dimensional or 1000 dimensional or even a million dimensional object, okay? So what's the complexity of steepest descent? So if you look at steepest descent, the only thing I need to do here, I mean, assuming alpha k can be picked appropriately, the only thing that I need to do is evaluate the gradient of function at xk, okay? Let's go to the Newton's method. In Newton's method, I have to run the following update. xk plus one equals to xk minus alpha k. second derivative at xk inverse gradient of fxk. So what kind of problem do you see, foresee with this particular iteration? What's the complexity of this iteration? Assuming your xk is maybe a million dimensional or 100 dimensional or 10,000 dimensional, what's the problem? The second derivative will be a square matrix of that dimension and we'll have to take inverse of that as well right right so first you have to compute the second derivative of the function f then you have to evaluate it at xk okay where xk is a uh, thousand or whatever dimensional what you get is a n cross n matrix after doing all this computation and that's not sufficient now you have to take inverse of that matrix, okay? So it's a lot of complexity embedded within this particular step, which is second derivative inverse step. And we would like to simplify this particular inverse, but I still want to retain the positive definiteness of the matrix. So I still want to have DK, which is positive definite, but I don't want to have my DK to be second derivative inverse because it's very complicated to compute. So what can oh, we do? Sorry, I have a ahead. question here. Yeah. Uh, so do we have any uh, solid idea that uh, the second derivative is invertible at this point? Uh, so, you know, throughout, we are going to assume that the second derivative is positive definite. Yeah. Remember this assumption? Yeah. yeah. And uh, of course, the inverse of a positive definite matrix is also a positive definite matrix. Okay because you have the inverse of eigenvalues. So if yeah, eigenvalues okay. are positive, then inverse of eigenvalues is also positive. Yes, yes. Uh, so yeah, so it's going to be positive definite. Okay, now of course you are, your question is valid when you are in a 
uh, where your function f is so complicated that you don't know a priori whether it's going to be convex or non-convex, well, whether it's going to be positive definite or not. And that's another situation where using Newton's method may have some problems where you don't know whether the function is locally convex or not, or whether the function has second derivative, which is positive definite or not. So you don't want to be using Newton's method in those situations. Okay. In particular, when you're training neural networks, I'm not sure whether you are interested in machine learning or not, but, but in case you are, if you're training neural networks, you don't use second derivative inverse because first, uh, it's very difficult to compute. And second, you don't quite know whether it's positive definite or not. So you just don't, you just avoid Newton's method altogether. Okay. Yep, makes sense. Any other question on Newton's method? Why Newton's method is better than the previous one? Right. So, so one way to easily see why Newton's method is better than the previous one is because you're using a better approximation of the function f. So remember this approximation step. For the Newton's method, this approximation is taking second order Taylor series. So it's, it's much better approximates the function f rather than the first order, first order um, expansion you took for the steepest descent. So that's one way to see why Newton's method would be better because the curvature information of the function f is embedded in the optimization algorithm itself. Whereas in this case, the curvature method, in the steepest descent case, the curvature is not embedded in the algorithm itself. So by curvature, I mean the second derivative information. So that's one way to look at it. The second way is slightly more mathematical, where you try and come up with the convergence speed of steepest descent versus Newton's method. And we will perhaps cover in the next class that Newton's method has what is known as superlinear convergence, which means that it converges much, much faster than steepest descent when you are close to the optimal solution. So we'll talk about it in perhaps the next class. Okay. Okay. So let's, so that then the third algorithm is diagonally scaled steepest descent. And in this algorithm, what do you do? Well, you pick your DK to be diagonal of DK1, DKN, where DK1 and DKN are all positive numbers. And you, of course, uh, stack it as a diagonal matrix. Um, any, any, any thoughts on how you could pick DKI? What would you pick DKI? So you want to imitate the Newton's method, but of course you don't want to go through the complexity of Newton's method. So what should your choice of DKI be? I give values of second derivative. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, I shouldn't use x k x i. Let me use y i. Okay, so x is equal to y one to y n. I don't want you to confuse between the two subscripts, so that's why I've changed the notation slightly. So this is evaluated at xk, and this is the second derivative with respect to the ith coordinate um, of the function, and then you take the inverse. And that becomes a diagonally scaled steepest descent. So it kind of retains some properties of the Newton's method, um, you know, so, but, but you don't have to compute the entire matrix, second derivative matrix. And because each of these dki's are positive, 
you know that this DK is a positive definite matrix and therefore it satisfies the requirement for it being a gradient descent algorithm. Any question on this one? I have a question. Yes. Uh, use the, how can we find the eigenvalues without computing the second the derivative, the, the whole second derivative? Uh, as you just mentioned uh, in this. Right. So you can't, you, you, you have to have some structure in the problem. So let's say you have, you're working on a signal processing problem where you have to, um, uh, so for instance, in compressed sensing type problems where you have, you're given a few data points and you want to re reconstruct the entire image, um, which is something that's done in image processing quite a lot. Then by the nature of the objective function, uh, many times you kind of know that it's convex and therefore the second derivative is going to be positive definite. Okay. Um, same thing in statistics, you know, a lot of uh, objective functions would be convex and therefore you, you just, the, the fact that it's positive definite is sort, sort of for free because you have constructed the objective function F itself, which is convex. Does that make sense? Uh, kind of, uh, but yeah. I'm still unsure. Uh, like how, without finding the second derivative, we are getting the. Uh, so this is a hypothesis. Matrix. This is a hypothesis. So, if it if your problem doesn't satisfy this condition, uh, or if you don't know, you just don't use Newton's method. It's simple. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Professor. Okay. Fourth is modified Newton's method. Where your DK is gradient second derivative of X zero. Second derivative of the function F at X zero inverse. So you just compute the second derivative once and then you don't compute it ever. Okay, so this also alleviates um, some of the difficulties associated with Newton's method because you just have to compute it once and not at every point of time. Okay, um, then there is the fifth one, which is discretized Newton's method where your DK is an approximation to a second derivative inverse. And now this approximation could come from uh, multiple ways. And so we will talk about what is known as quasi Newton's method. in uh, perhaps two or three lectures from now, where we will come up with fast and simple methods of computing the second derivative inverse without actually, uh, well, computing an approximation of the second derivative inverse without actually evaluating the second derivative itself. Okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it in like uh, maybe next week on Monday or next week on Wednesday. Okay, so these are different ways of picking DK. Now I want to talk about how to pick alpha K. So the first method for picking alpha K is minimization rule
Okay, so in minimization rule, what you do is you, you minimize the function values along the decay direction starting at xk. Okay, so you are starting at xk. This is your decay direction. And along this entire line, which goes all the way to infinity, you minimize the value of function and you pick alpha k such that minimizes this particular function along this entire direction. And we will again see conjugate direction method where this sort of minimization rule can be applied very easily without much overhead for computing this minimization. Okay. That's one way to pick alpha k. The second way to pick alpha k is limited minimization rule. Where alpha k is argmin, it's the same thing. But alpha now is in between zero and S. S is some upper bound on the value of alpha. Okay, so now you're sitting at XK. This is your uh, ray, which is in the direction of DK. And this is your XK plus SDK and you're trying to minimize the function within just along this particular line segment. So not along the entire ray, but only along a particular line segment. That's limited minimization rule. Uh, professor, I had a question. Yes. Uh, how do you choose S? Oh, S is a, uh, you just pick it from experience. Okay. Yeah. So typically it would be one if you don't have prior experience, but if you have prior experience, you can pick it, you know, based on your experience and uh, some sort of domain knowledge. Okay. okay. Thank you. The third one is constant step size. where alpha k is equal to alpha. Now again, you would ask how to pick alpha and I'm, it's going to be trial and error or it's just going to be uh, from experience. Okay, so um, to give you an example, we were running some reinforcement learning experiments where we picked alpha to be 10 raised to minus four and it seems to give us good result. But if instead we used alpha equals to 10 raised to minus two, uh, we weren't able to converse to anything that resembles like an optimal solution. So we had to reduce the step size to 10 raised to minus four after one weeks of simulation. So it's always trial and error. Okay, but a smaller value of alpha will always work, but certainly it will be very slow to get to the optimal solution. So you want to, so there is always a tension between increasing the value of alpha, which will make your algorithm unstable and you might, you know, your algorithm might blow up or you want to pick a very small value of alpha, but then you will converse to the solution after like really long time. So that's why there is some amount of trial and error in trying to figure out which one would work best for the problem at hand. Then the fourth method is Armijo's rule. And Armijo's rule is trying to adapt the step size. So it tries to adapt the step size according to some criteria. Some 
criteria. Um, let's look at what that criteria is. So alpha K, so let me, you need three parameters S, which is in zero and infinity, beta, which is in zero comma one, and sigma, which is greater than zero. But typically sigma would be roughly 10 raised to minus three. So you need these three hyperparameters and you pick alpha K to be S beta raised to M such that, or MK where MK is the smallest natural number satisfying FXK I'm going to pause here while you note it down. Okay. So let's see what Armijo's rule trying to do. So I have this function. This is my fx. This is my x. And this is my dk. So I need to go in this direction. And the problem that I'm facing is if I pick my step size equal to, let's, let's make it easy to understand. So let's say S is equal to one. So if I pick my step size S equal to one, remember I'm starting, so this is my XK and So this is my XK plus DK, okay, where, where my S is equal to one and M is equal to zero. So this is my XK plus DK. So how much, how much have I reduced the value of function by, by moving from XK to XK plus DK? Well, that's this amount. This is the amount. This is my FXK minus FXK plus DK. So I want this reduction to be larger than some threshold. What does that threshold depend on? Well, it depends on the inner product between the gradient and the direction D, and it depends on the step size S beta raised to M. So remember this S beta raised to M appears in two places here. And I want this reduction to be greater than certain threshold. If the threshold condition is not met, I'm going to reduce the value of my um, step size. So I'm going to pick XK plus S beta, well, S is equal to one, but S beta DK. So that's this point. 
and I'm going to look at the reduction in function. I'm going to see whether it meets the threshold condition or not. And if it meets the threshold condition, I say that, well, my M is equal to one and my alpha K is equal to S beta raised to MK. Okay, and I, I exit the inner loop and I go to the outer loop and I update the value of alpha K. I have the DK already and I take the, uh, the, the gradient step and after that I come back to this Armijo's rule after computing DK plus one. Okay, so it adaptively changes the value of step size depending on uh, this criteria of how much reduction you are getting in the value of the function by taking a step in that direction. Okay, any question? Okay, so let me go over it once again. So I have my XK, I have picked the DK, the descent direction where I need to go. I'm going to look at, I'm going to evaluate the function at fxk so i know fxk i know fxk plus sdk okay and i'm going to look at the reduction in the function value if this reduction is not substantial i'm going to reduce the step size and i'm going to recompute the reduction in function value with the updated step size and then if it meets the criteria great if it doesn't meet the criteria i'm going to reduce the step size further and i'm going to redo the computation so this is the Armijo's rule. What's the drawback with Armijo's rule in comparison to some of the other rules that we have seen above? We have to choose a lot of parameters. Yes, you have to pick a lot of parameters and you have to evaluate the function multiple times. Okay. Computation is expensive. Which is very, which could be very expensive depending on uh, how com complicated the function evaluation is. So you don't want to evaluate the function many, many times if your function evaluation is expensive. So let me just write it here. If function evaluation is expensive, then do not use or Miho's rule. Or you come up with your own step size selection rule inspired by Miho's rule, but which doesn't require as many function evaluation. Okay, so under what situation would the function evaluation be very expensive? Well, this is the case with many machine learning algorithms where you have very large data sets. Um, and then the function evaluation would require you to pass over the entire data set, which will take you half an hour to one hour just to evaluate the function once. And that's a problem for Arbiho's rule. Okay, then there is the fifth way, which is diminishing diminishing slash tapering step size. In this case, we want the summation of alpha k to be equal to infinity, k equals one to infinity or k equals, yeah, one to infinity or zero to infinity. And we want summation of alpha k square to be less than infinity. <laughs> so we want alpha k to go to zero. So this would imply that alpha k goes to zero but the sum of alpha k is equal to infinity. And so the examples are alpha k equals to c1 over c2 plus k one over k log k one over k raised to 0 0.5 plus delta where delta is in zero comma zero point five. 
and so on. You can come up with multiple ways of picking alpha k. Okay, so all of these alpha k's are going to zero as k goes to infinity. Um, they are not summable. So this is the not summable condition. And this is the square summable condition. So they are not summable, but they are square summable and they go to zero as k goes to infinity. Okay, any question on uh, step size selection rules? So let me go over all of them very quickly. So the first one we talked about was minimization rule where you minimize the function along a specific direction. Uh, then we talked about limited minimization rule where you minimize the function along a line segment. Um, then we talked about constant step size, which is extremely easy. There is no computation needed whatsoever. Just pick a step size and let it be. Then we talked about Armijo's rule, where you, your step size is adaptive. It adapts itself to the way function looks locally. Uh, it requires a little, a few hyperparameters, but that's not very complicated. The complicated situation here is that you need to do a lot of function evaluations in order to compute appropriate step size. So it may be not useful in data driven setting, but if your problem is small, then it probably is fine. It, it's not very complicated. If your XK is say, let's say only four or five dimensional, then this is not problematic. Um, then the last step size selection we, rule we talked about is diminishing step size. And I gave you some examples where the summation of alpha K is infinity, so it's not summable but the summation of alpha k square is less than infinity, so it is square summable, and alpha k goes to zero as k goes to infinity. Okay. So in the next class, I want to talk about convergence of gradient descent algorithm. So today we are out of time, so I can't talk about convergence. And in order to understand the convergence, I want you to just remember this definition for the next class. So XK is gradient related to DK if and only if this is a definition. So that's why there is an if and only if here, it's how we define it. If XK converges to X bar such that gradient of fx bar is not equal to zero, then limpsup k goes to infinity, gradient of fx k transpose dk is strictly less than zero. Okay. What this means is, I'll let you guys write it and then I'm just going to plot a diagram so you understand what it means. So this axis is gradient of fxk transpose dk. And I'm looking at the inner product between gradient of fxk transpose dk as a function of k 
and I want, so this function is allowed to, this inner product is allowed to oscillate, but I want to have a upper bound on this, on this uh, inner product so that the entire function is below this upper bound and this upper bound has to be negative. So let's say negative 0 0.1 or something. So some negative value, it doesn't have to be 0 0.1, but some negative value. So this is the meaning of the limb soup as k goes to infinity of gradient of fxk transpose dk to be negative, to be less than zero, okay? So this whole sequence eventually is below a negative number, okay? That's what it means for xk to be gradient related to dk. And so in the next class, we will uh, I'm not going to go over the proof, but I'm going to talk about convergence of uh, different types of gradient descent algorithms, um, uh, which will use this definition. So with that, I end this class. If there are any questions, you can ask me now, or, or we could talk during the office hours on Friday. No questions? All right. Oh, professor. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, question? So, yeah. So, you, you showed like uh, a bunch of methods for choosing D and a bunch of methods for choosing alpha K. That's right. So, when, 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 this, then when this is put into application, uh, so this is going to be a combination of choosing alpha K and DK. Right. Is there any specific ways or recommendations for, uh, okay, no. for this method? Okay, there's nothing like that, okay. No, um, it's all uh, domain knowledge, it's all experience. Okay. And uh, you know, like suppose you go for Google, you know, go to a company and you, you work for that company, you will just ask your supervisor, what is it that you should try at the beginning? And then based on the experience you accumulate, you will adapt the choice of positive definite matrix or the choice of alpha K, you know, based on just the experience that you accumulate over time. Okay. And uh, the second question is, uh, so we've all seen like just like mathematical equations for all these algorithms. Uh, right. Will we get to see any examples solved in class or will, they, will that be like? It's all in the forward? assignment. So if you go to okay. assignment two and assignment okay. three, they okay. are coding heavy assignments. Mm -hmm. um, and then assignment four, five, and six, they will be theory heavy assignments. So there is a balance of both coding as well as theory. In this okay. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. The best way to learn how an algorithm functions is actually to implement it yourself. Okay. So you will get a chance to do that both in the, and as well as in the project, by the way. So I'm not sure whether you have given a thought to the project topic, but the deadline is coming up in a couple of weeks. So you should probably start thinking what is it that you want to do your project in. And if you're interested in applications, which I would highly encourage uh, for you to look into applications, uh, you should uh, you know, start thinking along those lines and what kind of algorithms you would like to implement for your project. All right, so see you guys on Friday. Um, thank you for your attention.